a dark, dreary day. The rain is pitter-pattering outside my window. The sun is but a, a distant memory, so it's a perfect time to cozy up with a centuries-long prosecution of witches, which is basically the history of the prosecution of, of women and some men. My name is Teresa and this is the history of witch fashion. Witch fashion. So how did we arrive at this iconic witch look, the witch that you know and love, the witch of Halloween costumes, the wicked witch of the West? How did we get here? How did she acquire her pointy black hat, and her black dress, and her pointy witch shoes, and her warty nose? Let's go back. Let's go way, way, way back. Let's embark on a bloody, bloody history. Let's go back to Europe in the 1500s, the 16th century. Drop a pin on Saxony, Germany. The first known depiction of a witch was in the best-selling book called Malleus Maleficarum, translated as The Hammer of the Witches. It was written by Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Springer. Yeah, those guys. They wrote what was essentially a field guide, spot in your village, women who could be witches and how to eradicate them from this world and maybe force them through torture to repent their pagan ways. The depiction of these witches, it's not pretty. They're naked and they're doing a variety of unsavory activities such as dancing around a bonfire, probably to conjure up Satan. They're riding on broomsticks. They're hanging out with this goat and it's not even a cute goat. It's like an ugly goat. They're older ladies. They've got saggy flesh. There's a lot of vibrations going on in all these activities. They've got your old crone face, toothless with warts. These illustrations remind me of a modern day beauty ad, an anti-aging ad warning young ladies that if you do not adhere to your 20 step skincare routine, you're going to end up like this old hag. It's advertising by fear. I believe since the dawn of time, society basically hates older women. They hate aging and they hate older women. And at the same time, they also hate women who are independent and do not adhere to patriarchal norms. 16th century Germany, there were women, they were selling beer out of their homes. In order to signify that they were in the ale brewing business, they wore pointy hats and they were flourishing. They were doing pretty well. They were earning a decent income. Um, they didn't really need need a man. That didn't sit well with several men in the villages. They also saw that she was flourishing financially and maybe they could get into it. So what did they do? Accuse her of being a witch? Take her business. In any instance of history when it comes to a witchcraft accusation, there's always some kind of greedy financial ulterior motive involved. Usually the accuser is like a salty person. They're losers. They have nothing going on in their life. They see somebody who who is flourishing, somebody who is breaking societal norms. Why is this person so successful? What do they have going on? They don't seem that smart. They don't seem that pretty. Why? They must have made a pact with the devil. I'm gonna accuse them of consorting with, with a goat. Salty people are the most dangerous people. In the Hammer of the Witches and similar medieval superstitions, clothes were thought to have magical powers. If you're accusing this alewife who wears her trade trademark uniform, her pointy hat, or the Jewish population of wearing a pointy hat. You're going to attribute that hat to having magical powers. We're going through the centuries, creating this origin story of the witch's iconic look, the witch's wardrobe. So the pointy alewife hat, her uniform in the 1600s, the buckle pointy shoes were also in these shoes. That's how we associate that with the witch's shoes. And the broomstick, well, who didn't have a broomstick back in the medieval days? According to Christian Soleil, she states that the evidence is certainly suggestive that witches have been practicing sex magic with their lubed up broomstick. Witch trial transcripts do refer to witches rubbing hallucinogenic ointments on their... So I wouldn't be surprised if these single women in the medieval days, they had some extra cash to spare from their beer brewing business and they probably want to live away from the village. They're smart. The village was disgusting. 
back then. People threw their raw sewage out the window. There was hogs in the street, people dying of the plague. And they probably were like, no, I don't want to live in the city. So I'm going to move my cabin. I'm going to have like a nice tranquil cabin in the woods. And they're self-sufficient people, probably know a lot about herbs. They have this herb garden. They know what rosemary is. Maybe they are also like botanists and they go into the, the black forest and they find some mushrooms. These mushrooms didn't kill me, but they did make me feel better. Maybe they took these mushrooms, grinded it up in an ointment, a bomb, and they took this bomb and they put it on. They put it on their, their areas. And because they didn't have like a husband, they didn't need one. They have their broomstick for sweeping and then they have their broomstick for other things. Because they lived in the woods and they thought it was isolated, they did all this in their garden, in their herb garden, or maybe in a hammock. Maybe some men in the village, maybe the friar, maybe the bishop, maybe the guy with the the goat, they're trying to catch her. So they sneak into the woods and they hide behind a bush with a spyglass. Ooh, ooh, she's having a good time with a broomstick and a bomb and a goat. Not on my watch. You know what she is? She's a witch. Let's fast forward to 1692. But before we begin, let me just take a second to gently nudge you to the subscribe button. And if you've made it this far and you're enjoying yourself, why not hit the like button as well? The settlement of Salem. They went through a, a dark time. Crop failures, smallpox epidemic, a harsh New England winter, territory wars with Native Americans, and a strict surveillance by the Puritanical Society. So the Puritans, they sailed from England to escape religious prosecution. And so it's like the people who were being prosecuted in England sailed over here so they wouldn't be prosecuted and they would have the freedom to prosecute other people. This all brewed in a witch's cauldron, if you will. Several girls in the society accusing people of witchcraft. 18 men and women were tried and hung. And one of them was pressed to death. They put about 17 very heavy stones on him, crushed him. So he must have pissed somebody off or maybe they ran out of rope or something. Anybody who's into Halloween, Salem, Massachusetts is on a bucket list. First and foremost, the Hocus Pocus filming locations, the Ropes Mansion, the City Hall where Bette Midler saying, I put a spell on you. And then there was the witch house where everybody takes their photo in front of, and that house belonged to one of the judges of the Salem witch trials, and it's reported to be haunted because he was the judge that sentenced 18 men and women to death. And then there was the actual site of the executions, which I believe a modern day Walgreens or CVS, but there was a memorial called Proctor's Ledge where we remember the dark stain on human history that is the Salem witch trials. So in Salem, they had a bunch of disasters that they could not account for at the time. This was before the age of enlightenment, before science and reason. There was no enlightenment back then. Everything could be explained by the work of God or the devil, the occult. It's easier to blame somebody else than it is to take on personal responsibility. And you see that's always been the case even nowadays. Things weren't going well for them. Somebody had to be blamed. In this case, instead of blaming an outcast on the fringes of society, the main accusers were the daughters of certain select men, if Arthur Miller's crucible served me right, they were pointing the finger at John Proctor, who had property, was also a respected member of society. It was daughters of certain members of society who were probably salty over John Proctor and his success and his land. Maybe his crops didn't fail. His corn. What kind of crops did they grow there? Wheat. His wheat didn't fail, the harvest. And then if you can him, you can take his land, expand your property, expand your wallet. Elizabeth Perry and Abigail Williams began having convulsions, hallucinating, and screaming. It is believed that these were caused by certain molds present in bread and wheat that became damp while being stored over the winter. That fungus, that mold, that can mess you up in the movie starring Daniel Day-Lewis, 1993. That was Salem's claim to fame. If you go there, they do have memorabilia from the movie. They have some steins. A main component of this movie was that the judges really wanted you to confess and accuse somebody else. If you pretend to be the victim, you you got off the hook by laying the blame on somebody else. But if you refuse to confess, it, you're done. And I remember John Proctor, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, he would not confess because he didn't want to sully his name. What am I without my name? Does that sound like Daniel Day-Lewis? I'm an oil man. I have given you my soul. Leave me my name. So that was his thing. 
he would not sully his good name. His name meant everything to him. The honor, you know, the honor. But this is where I believe we got the witch outfit. It's like a slice of Puritan. Also just 1600s woman's dress. A stay, your underclothes, your shift peeping out of your corset. You know, around this time, late 1600s, the sleeves would be sewed like very loosely, like here and leave an inch here. And then you have your stays peeping out. And it was a sign of your material wealth if you kept your whites, your stays or your cami or whatever, you keep them snowy white. What we have here, folks, this is the hocus pocus look. This is basically Basically, Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker's look. She's like a colonial Puritan, but sexy. And then we have Bette Midler's look. And she's going for a Elizabeth the first look. It's actually pretty accurate. Back in the Elizabethan age, it was considered a sign of beauty to have a very big forehead, big forehead energy. In fact, ladies would shave their head all the way back here to increase the size of their forehead, which would make them more beautiful. Now we jump forward from Salem, Massachusetts, 1692 to the Victorian age, the 19th century, the industrial revolution, the steam engine factories in full force. Victorian people are really into the occult. It was a time of rapid change. You went from an agricultural society, people lived in villages, farmed wheat. And with the advent of technology, steam engine, the railroad, they moved to the big cities where they worked low wage hazardous factory job. 1850s, everybody was working in the factories. Children were working in the factories. They were weaving fabric with very dangerous looms. They were using their little hands to polish machinery. People were working in very hazardous conditions, long hours, not even a 40 hour work week, more than a 40 hour work week. I don't even, I think they only had Sundays off. Women and children were working. They were getting maimed by hazardous weaving machines. Basically, it's kind of like they were working in Xi'an were overcrowded in cities, there was smog in the air, tuberculosis, children were dying young. You were lucky to make it past infancy. As a result of this rapid change in technology, people found comfort in spiritualism, in the occult. People were doing seances, they were commuting with the dead, they were collecting souvenirs, like morbid souvenirs. In the Victorian ages, they had these things called hair wreaths, where you would take hair from your beloved or from family members, a bunch of people's hair, you just go around collecting people's hair, scooping them up from the carpet and making these wreaths. You collected memento moris, morbid souvenirs, death masks of the deceased. You had those really creepy photography sessions of dead people. So in the Victorian age, the idea of witches as being scary of the occult, pagan, devil worshiping demons, they became symbols of morbid fascination. When you think about the Victorian times, you think about ladies in mourning because Queen Elizabeth lost her husband Albert. She committed herself to a lifetime of wearing widow's black and a lot of ladies also follow suit. A lot of ladies also lost loved ones, husbands, children, mourning, mourning wear. It was the first time in post-Christian history that witchcraft was socially acceptable. It was fun to talk about it, to read books about it. They basically turned it into a parlor game in the same vein that they would have seances to commune with the dead. Witchcraft also also became in vogue. So the Victorian ages is where we also collect the black witch's dress, the widow's black mourning dress. Nothing spells creepy like Victorian mourning dress. We move forward in time to the 1920s, the Ipswich Hosiery Company. They made stockings. Their advertisement included this. They ran their stocking ads during Halloween. It was a Halloween trademark. She became a very cute 1920s flapper jazz age witch. That was where we started to associate witches with stockings, cute stripes stockings. You can see the look of a witch went from this to this to this to this. She went from something very sinister. She's naked. She's ugly. She's an old crone. And we've kept some of her ugly face. And we moved to a persona that's an object of morbid fascination to something cute and whimsical and cozy. And we're going to put together a modern day witchy wardrobe. Because after centuries worth of bloody history and injustice, let's uh, 
Let's make it fashion. I've already talked about the Whimsigoth aesthetic, a bohemian earth mother witch meets 90s grunge. So if you are interested in that video, check it out right here. But today we are going to put together a traditional witch outfit that you can wear for the modern day. A heavy nod to the 1962 Salem witch trials. We're going to go for Puritan chic. We got the Puritan outfit, but we're gonna make it modern and sexy. It's Puritan but fashion. What you need is a black blouse or a black sweater with a snowy white collar, a snowy white lacy collar or a Peter Pan collar. So you can pair that with a pointy hat if you want. That's very Halloween. That's very on the nose. Or you could just have like a wide brim Riviera hat. You definitely want stockings, colorful stockings in a pumpkin-esque orange. And you've got to include something sheer, like a sheer shawl, a sheer blouse, letting your black bra peep through, a gauzy, satinesque white blouse with a black ribbon tied together at the neck, accessorized with a black choker necklace, a cross, or some celestial moon motif. I like to refer to designer Simone Rocho. She has the perfect juxtaposition between baby doll, the coquette look, hyper feminine touches, soft and comforting, and then she pairs that with something harsh, chunky, platform boots, black leather corsets, leather harnesses. So there's just like a juxtaposition between something hyper feminine and sweet and something dark and sinister and grunge. Coquette meets Spanish Inquisition. If you can find one, carry a purse that's shaped like the holy hand grenade. Refer to the coronation picture of Queen Elizabeth I. She's holding a scepter and a holy hand grenade. So when I was in seventh grade, I had two best friends. They came as a pair. One day, Mary pulled me aside during lunch into a corner of the girls' bathroom. Teresa, I'm going to tell you a secret and you have to swear upon your life to never tell anyone. What kind of secret? Teresa, Joyce and I, we're witches. What? Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. And another thing, we want you to join. I was all worked up. I was very excited. I've never been a witch before. I, I didn't know any witches. Apparently my two best friends, they were, they were practicing witchcraft. So it quickly came down to Mary and Joyce divulging to me what kind of powers they bring to the table. And very efficiently, they've also recruited Amy, whom I, I didn't even know she existed, but here she is part of the friends group. Four witches, four little witches with our maroon lipstick. It was, it was 97. Sometimes we would outline our lips with just like brown lip liner. This was a middle school in Long Beach. We're just like mildly dipping our toe into that chola territory. Each of us were supposed to have like a specific power, a specific niche. Mary, who's kind of like the queen bee, the boss of us all, reading people's minds like telepathy. Joyce, she controlled the weather. She was like storm. Amy, she was weird. I don't know where she came from. I don't know where they found her. She spoke to animals and more specifically birds. So when we we're in the quad, she would just randomly come up to these pigeons or seagulls. There was a lot of trash in the quad and she'd go like, ah! I don't know if like the birds were supposed to come to her, but they certainly, she just kind of like scattered the flock. And for a while, I didn't know what my powers were. Neither did anybody else. If you want to stay in this coven, you have to think up your power. So I thought and I thought I literally spent a lot of time thinking about this. I came home and I couldn't even concentrate on Xena, warrior princess. The hell is my witch power? And then one day, Mary, she was kind of impatient. Teresa, what is your power? I'm busy reading minds here. Joyce is communing with nature. What do you bring to the table? And I didn't know. I wasn't like really creative back then. So Mary, she thought long and hard. Teresa, I've got it. It came to me, came to me while I was nibbling on my, my nachos. I know what your power is. You, Teresa, your power. What is my power, Mary? What is my power? Your power. Your power is math. Yes, my power, my power was, was math. So we have the girl who could read minds, Storm here, communing with nature. And we've got the girl that scared all the seagulls. But my power, I could do long division. 